Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Archaeology Abridged talk of the 2022-2023 season. My name is Ben Thomas, and I'm the AIA's Director of Programs. For those of you joining us for the first time, AIA is North America's oldest and the world's largest archaeological organization with over 200,000 supporting and subscribing members. From its founding in 1879, the AIA has been committed to supporting archaeology and archaeologists, publishing and disseminating the results of archaeological research, and providing programming like this one uh, for a variety of audiences. We started Archaeology Abridged in 2020 when the pandemic-related shutdowns and quarantines prevented us from holding in-person events. Archaeology Abridged talks were our way of continuing to provide quality archaeological programming to an audience that was largely homebound. Now, the program proved to be popular, not just with the homebound, but also with folks who couldn't, for a variety of reasons, physically attend an AIA program. Uh, because of the feedback we received and the popularity of the program, we decided to make Archaeology Abridged a permanent part of the AIA's virtual programming. Now, all AIA programs like this one are supported by our members and by donors. You can continue to and or you can support our programs by donating to the AIA's <coughs> annual fund at archaeological.org slash donate. You can also support us by becoming a member. You can join at archaeological.org slash join. As a member, you will be able to receive regular updates and information about all our up, up, all our upcoming programs. Uh, as I mentioned before, today's talk is the first of the 2022-2023 Archaeology Bridge season. Before I go any further, let me just remind you that we are recording this program, but we ask that you, uh, the attendees, do not. The recording will be available on our YouTube channel, and we'll make sure that you get the link to it as well so you can watch it again uh, after uh, today. I'm thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Krish Sita. Dr. Sita is an environmental archaeologist specializing in zooarchaeology. He's an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford, at Stanford University and has an educational background in biology, health studies, and ecology. His research integrates archaeological, historical, anthropological, and climate science, climate science data and approaches. Since 2008, he has directed the Mauritian Archaeology and Cultural Heritage MAC project, which focuses on bringing the unique and rich archaeological past of Mauritius to a wide audience. MAC engages with a scientific approach to historical archaeology, and the project centers on the movement of peoples and material cultures, specifically within the context of slavery and diaspora, and focuses on key sites on the island nation of Mauritius. Using a systematic program of excavation and environmental sampling, MAC aims to better understand the transition from slavery to indentured labor following abolition, the extent and diversity of trade in the region, and the environmental consequences of intense monoculture agriculture. Dr. Sita's talk will be followed by a time for Q&A. Remember to enter your questions for Krish in the Q&A window and not the chat window, uh, and we'll address them after the talk. Krish, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. And just while I share my screen, I really want to express most sincerely to, to uh, uh, um, Ben Thomas, the program director, Meredith, and the, of course, the um, ASL interpreters, the entire team. I'm so honored to have a chance to speak to you today and present this work. Um, and in particular, I, I encourage everybody, join the AIA, support them, donate. Excellent cause. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to have a chance to speak to you today. I, um, a very kind introduction from Ben. I just want to also mention um, the background sort of influences the work that we're presenting, that I'm presenting here. And I'm presenting on behalf of a, an excellent team of colleagues who work in, at Dias in Kafoskari, part of um, the University of Kafoskari in Venice. Uh, excellent um, scientists, basically, archaeological scientists who have really taken on board the mandate to, to investigate these data sets that I'll show you today, really to the best of their ability. They've done an excellent job. Um, I also want just very briefly to explain this image. This is actually from the site that we'll be, I'll be focusing on today, a site called Nemorn. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site that commemorates resistance to enslavement. And this image is uh, um, a local artist uh, basically showing the breaking out 
actually local basalt stone that you can see there, the image of somebody, the sculpture of somebody actually breaking out from the confines of Instream. It's a really, really poignant site. A couple of other things I just want to mention very briefly. This work is at the moment, it's still unpublished. It's um, uh, very near publication. We're just hopefully a few weeks away, away from submitting. So um, the results are not out yet, but I, I hope that you'll see they're worth, um, they're, they're valuable and worth the interest here. Uh, basically, I want to make sure that I clear, I clearly say basically this paper is, focuses very much on how enslaved people responded to the debilitating conditions of their working lives. And we're using Mauritius as a case study here, and I'll just very briefly um, outline the, the, the site itself, the main site. Um, there's actually, it's, it's a relatively odd place for, for um, an island that's quite close to places like Madagascar and other islands. Mauritius has no indigenous population and all changes that we see are consequential to human activity. So very much an island colonized under the mantle of colonialism, excuse me. Um, enslavement, really this is a, a very interesting part of the world to study enslavement because each colonial group, there were Dutch, French and British, each colonial group brought to diversity of enslaved people from different ethnic groups. Um, and according to uh, prominent historians like Richard Allen, this was one of the most diverse um, hubs of enslaved people from both Africa and Asia and our own um, DNA results of modern populations and also the ancient population show that. There were revolts, resistance was common, hence um, the inauguration of this World Heritage Site to commemorate resistance. However, there weren't the types of enslaved republics that we see in other parts of the Atlantic, um, in the Atlantic context, for example. Mauritius is also the site where indenture, the system, the, term, the great experiment was undertaken by the British after the abolition in slavery to replace enslaved people with indentured laborers. Um, so really what I want to emphasize here is not only Mauritius as a, a key site for studying the life ways of laboring peoples, but also to look at the changing nature of work and how work um, really comes to represent so much more in our, in our lives and the lives of um, ancestral populations because of what was happening during the process of colonialism. I want to just focus now very briefly on Le Monde Brabant itself. The, the site of the World Heritage Site is actually here. Um, I use this image to illustrate, it's just a really fantastic, it's a beautiful part of the island. Here's a little, uh, it's right at the very south southwesternmost tip of the island, um, and it's an Inselberg. It's basically a plateau, and uh, the story behind Le Monde and why it was commemorated was that at the point at which um, the British were coming to tell enslaved Maroons, sorry, uh, um, runaway slaves, basically, uh, the Maroons that they were actually free, that slavery was now abolished. They didn't realize that the, they were, the soldiers were actually coming to, to tell them they were free. They assumed that the soldiers were coming to recapture them. And rather than go back to um, a circumstance of enslavement, they actually jumped off this plateau. So that's local oral traditions and they really commemorated the site um, since 2008. We've undertaken surveys there since 2009. Um, we worked for a number of seasons. This is a small island called Ilofono used to um, apparently where enslaved people were tortured. Um, there was a, the cemetery that I'm gonna focus on is right about here, but I just want to bring you the, the site to your, um, to your attention itself. The old cemetery that we excavated is just one of the most beautiful ephemeral sites I've ever had the pleasure to work on. Initially, these outlines of basalt block, they were completely concealed. Maybe the indications locally with local colleagues have sort of suggested three or four um, grave outlines as we, as we later determined. In fact, we, we, when we cleared the site with, with our local colleagues, we found in the region of 45, um, 48 of these tomb outlines. There is some overlap, which is why a clear number isn't necessarily um, possible. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we worked very closely. This was one. Of, this was the first such site for the Republic, received intense national attention, uh, regularly featured on TV. And in fact, this uh, little image here, when we, we undertook the first DNA results from this site, and uh, um, when we announced those results, we told the officer in charge at that time, the director of the Le Monde Trust Fund, uh, the results had, had come back for the DNA. He immediately called the Minister of Arts and Culture, who immediately called 
the TV and this was Sunday afternoon at three o'clock and by Sunday at six, it was on the news. So it was just an incredibly important site. It really has immense impact locally. You can see our colleagues working with us. And ultimately our results um, were used to show quite clearly that Madagascan, the people of Madagascar and Mozambican descent were buried. So it really brought the enslaved context into sharp relief for the local community and also the national community. Very quickly to show you some of the results from the site itself before I move specifically onto the medicinal context that I wanted to touch, I wanted to focus on today. As you'll see here in this first image, this site is a, was an incredibly important site for local memory because it was clear that there was there, this is an inhumation at the bottom before it's been completely exposed, but there were regular reconstructions and re-outlining of these inhumations. So there was clear evidence of memory. There were, as you can imagine for enslaved people, very few material um, material artifacts left, but some of them were incredibly impressive. This is a small mother of pearl button. Um, we had other buttons and bottles, a few coins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this child inhumation here, there were quite a number of child inhumations, as one might expect from the context and from that time period. Um, I'll come to another child inhumation in a second. This image, actually, um, the only evidence we had, and I have to give credit to my colleague Sacha Chaval, who was able to excavate this darker outline around this individual, this child inhumation is actually all that was left of the wood from the coffin. So no actual wood, just a discoloration. So it was incredible exercise in ex you know, excavation technique and talent to be able to reveal that. And it actually was featured in the Antiquity magazine. It won the image um, prize for Antiquity a few years ago. One final, um, so sorry, just to come back to that slide, there's very clear evidence of reuse of materials, there's really clear evidence of reverence for the individuals. Um, perhaps the most poignant example uh, was a, a female individual who seemed to have died during childbirth. Um, you know, as an archaeologist, you sometimes have these, um, these moments during excavation where you, you really feel much more emotionally connected to um, the excavation then is normal. It, it's some, when you're working with human remains, there's, there's obviously a lot more um, poignancy in this actual uh, process of excavation. This uh, individual, this woman, it seems if she actually uh, died during pregnancy right at the very end, so the, the infant was either born stillborn, or what we assume is more likely the case, I see this is what we call a coffin birth where um, the mother died during childbirth and the baby was actually expelled during the decomposition process. Hence, the, in the, the infant is some distance from the pelvic region itself. Um, and I'll just remind you, actually, this site is waterlogged on occasion and it's tidal. So this would explain why there was movement of the, individual, in, of the infant away from the mother. Concentrating on the specific um, topic of our presentation today, one, of, one set of finds we recovered from three individuals, we found one class of finds, I should say, these pipes. And there was many examples. A colleague of mine here is holding um, one example uh, of, a, of a European clay pipe. Um, these three individuals were all male. And after the um, excavations were over, we wanted to see what was actually being smoked in these pipes. Now, in general, overwhelmingly, and this is one of those moments where the colonial context is very present in even contemporary archaeological work, which is why it's always an effort for us to try and you know, move beyond the colonial context, really to decolonize our subject. Um, what was our, what was this in, in general, there's been relatively little scientific analysis, uh, residue analysis of tobacco pipes, because as name implies, we've assumed because they were used for tobacco in European and in, in generally also in, in Atlantic, so also North American context, we've assumed that tobacco was the main um, product smoked in these pipes uh, on, a, on a much more global scale. What our results revealed is that actually, through this very um, precise gas chromatography um, spectrography analysis. So this is the residues that are actually scraped. This is you know, very, very fine um, residue analysis. 
uh, a micro scale, you're seeing these small burnt residues of what was actually in the pipes themselves. So we undertook this, this analysis and we would have expected tobacco. Of course, these are tobacco pipes. Um, we might even have expected cannabis because there was um, our, uh, the context of being relatively close to Africa. And we know that there was a cannabis culture that developed in the East Coast of Africa. Also because of the move, and I mentioned to you that it was quite important about the move to indentured labor. We assume that actually indentured laborers bought cannabis with them because it had been a quite prominent part of um, South Asian Indian culture for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So we weren't necessarily surprised when we found tobacco. We were somewhat surprised to find marijuana. And already that gave us an indication of what was actually taking place. Perhaps there was a little bit more to, the, the, to what was being smoked in these pipes um, than simply as a, a recreational product. What really was shocking to us was to find salvia divinorum, the salvia plant. And basically salvia divinorum is cultivated by Mazteca people in Oaxaca in Mexico, 17,000 kilometers away in a straight line. So there's no way that these, a group of enslaved people in Mauritius, resistance fighters and uh, um, Mazteca people in Oaxaca, there's no actual connection between them. In fact, uh, Salvia divinorum is only known to Western science from 1938. And it's used by the Mazteca people for divin divination in a spiritual context. And there is some indications of palliative strategies again. It's only been propagated from the 1960s. And again, that's been in California. It's actually quite a difficult plant to propagate from cultivars. It's got a very narrow niche. More important than that, the family of Salvia divinorum is the Laminaceae. There are no, no local Laminaceae in the Mascarene Islands at all. So we can be sure this was a plant brought to Mauritius. How and why this happened, we have very little way of knowing and how it ends up in the grave of an enslaved man is even more fascinating to us. But why it's in the grave of an enslaved man, perhaps we've got some indications of that. This, these are two bones, a femur and a radius, from that individual that I showed you, there was many, many other indications of this type of pathological condition. Effectively, um, you may not know the bones I'm talking about, but I think you could probably guess without much difficulty that these bones absolutely are not quote unquote normal. There is definitely evidence of pathology here. And this is actually osteomyelitis. This is um, bone infection. There are other indications on these skeletal remain of these, of these individuals, these, these human remains really show a lot of evidence for a very hard working life. Um, changes to the spine, changes around the neck and the shoulders, of course, as we expect in a population of people who were formerly enslaved. Even if they were resistance fighters, they'd been through this process of enslavement, they'd had to work on plantations. There was also a lot of indications of dental disease. And what we see at this present moment when enslaved people were actually free from the plantations, they effectively fall from the pages of history. They fall also from any sort of health care. So they are turning to medicinal practices that are um, traditional, that are historic, that are through oral, passed through oral traditions. And the use of marijuana, even today, if, uh, marijuana has a, a very long history. The earliest um, pharmacopoeia basically indicate marijuana as a means of, of pain relief, um, a palliative um, a plant. It would of course appear that that was clearly in use there as well. But the use of salvia divinorum as a smoke product in, uh, the, in Oaxaca by the, the Mazteca people tend to chew um, salvia. Uh, in Mauritius, it's actually a smoked product. So a completely different use, a different way of ingesting the, the, the plant. And it would seem that all of this was for medicinal practices. So we actually finally, this is the first time, to my knowledge, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but it's the first time where we're seeing concrete scientific evidence for palliative strategies, for medicinal uses of plants by enslaved people to, to deal not only with the immensely difficult situation of the working uh, life, but also what happens post-emancipation when there isn't healthcare, 
but also what it may be the case in how they were dealing with the psychological stress of being in this incredibly difficult situation um, and you know the the malnutrition and the other factors that were affecting health the, the poor situation of well-being was all um, situated within this context and it seems that marijuana and salvia were used in palliative strategies along with tobacco of course um, one thing that is highly speculative so i want to make sure that I, i'm very clear about that but one of the earliest first evidence that we have um, both written and material context, so historical and archaeological, that talk about marijuana within a palliative, within a medicinal context, is actually to relieve the pain of childbirth. So it may have been that outside of the use of by these three males, these three men, um, to deal with their own personal health problem, um, um, pain, this was also, marijuana may have been used more broadly, and we may have, uh, it may also have been a case where we um, have marijuana used for for this um, female individual as well. Less speculative is that we, no doubt, this is a site that has a traditional, a local form of what we would term a syncretic belief system, more commonly layman's terms in the Atlantic context is voodoo or Hudao. In Mauritius, it's called Lorganis. Um, and we have a lot of indications the cross is not actually uh, a Christian effigy, it's a mechanism of power to, to draw on the power of, of all, all religions. So we know that spiritualism was a large part of this area. Um, sorry for the quality of this image, this is the only thing that I could find to show. We also know that there were banyan trees around the, the site of Limon used for traditional dance and so on. So maybe these um, products were also being used within a spiritual context as well. Um, and in fact, Stigatipik, which is um, a local dance and music for Mauritius, UNESCO inscribed as well, is known to have originated from this region. Ultimately, uh, this uh, just in summary, our outcomes very much provide a, an incredibly important chronological marker on the dynamic role played by medicinal plants in society over time. And we know the context of marijuana and other medicinal plants today is, is gaining interest massively. So we have gaps and the colonial period is a big gap. And we are actually hoping to close some of that with our understanding of how the legacies of enslavement, how we can actually study those and actually give relevance to enslaved populations for the work that for, for their own agency. We also need to broaden our gaze and look beyond the Atlantic iteration of enslavement if we want to provide the type of understanding about this period as a whole that descendant communities really deserve. But as important, our findings really urge for better integration of scientific approaches into the practice of historical archaeology and um, Tushingham's work on indigenous consumption of tobacco in North America, and I hope our results now they really show that the, these analyses completely overturn accepted knowledge about colonial interactions. We've seen Salvia divinorum make its way through a network covering some 17,000 kilometers at least to the grave of an enslaved man in Mauritius from Mexico. So the cryptic movements of traded plants and goods that we have no knowledge of in history, archeology span can really shed light on that. And in the same way, understanding the agency and practices of medicinal, sorry, medicinal practices of enslaved people is really critical to providing a much better understanding of enslavement and the life ways of laboring peoples. Thank you very much. Many, many people I have to thank, and I hope these acknowledgements, they don't really do justice, but thank you. Uh, muted. I think I'm unmuting while I'm <laughs> being muted by someone else. Okay, um, we've reached my favorite part of our key bridge. This is when I get to grill you. Um, and as I mentioned before, folks, put your questions in the Q&A box. And as people are putting questions in the Q&A box, I have a couple things that I just wanted to ask you first. One is, could you give us a quick definition of enslaved versus indentured? Um, enslaved was with effectively without pay. Um, and of course, the, lab, uh, the, the uh, enslaved peoples were considered chattel. Um, they were considered to be owned by, in, by an individual, uh, a, a colonial elite. Indentured laborers were in principle free. 
Um, the talk that I gave last time, Ben, I, I hope it just sort of jogs your memory, but in some cases we found what look, well, we found shackles that look as if they were coming from the period of indenture as well. So there was, I mean, it was a, it was an exercise in response to the abolition in trade right. in enslaved people. It wasn't really an exercise in how to treat people who work for you better. Right, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and Chris is referring to a talk that he gave uh, about a week or so ago, and that is going to be, uh, or is already on our YouTube channel. So if you're curious to learn more, uh, we, will, we will have that link for you as well. Um, Chris, there are, so if I'm looking off the side, it's to, to look at the, side, the, the questions no that are coming up. Um, and I will start uh, one, the first question I want uh, that we would like you to answer is, uh, you talked about, uh, especially when enslaved people are freed, uh, are liberated, they are dropping off uh, kind of from view and they're dropping off from healthcare. What is at this point the difference between healthcare for the enslaved people and, uh, and, the, and the, the slavers, the people who own them? Uh, how different is it? Even until, even to the present day, so one of the, the kind of legacies of colonialism in, in Mauritius is to do with healthcare. We have a system where um, pharmacies around the island sort of serve as your first line of, of, of health provision. You go to a pharmacy, you, you speak to the pharmacist, you say, I've got X, Y, and Z, and they will. And that's, it's more so than you, you sort of bypass a doctor. Now that's a somewhat of a legacy of colonialism because there was um, on every plantation in general, on most plantations, certainly the large ones, there was uh, a kind of dispensary, shall we say, where you could receive some um, treatment for injuries and so on. There was also a, on, on the plantations, whether it was for enslaved, certainly for enslaved people, even during the period of indenture, there's a ration provided. For indentured laborers, they had to buy their ration. Of course, for enslaved people, they were given meals. Um, of course, these amiga, we, we, our understanding of diet is not, is not going to be precise because we've got information from historical records, but whether that was adhered to is, is another question entirely. And our own analysis on diet using isotopes, it's never going to be precise enough to know. We can, we can sort of tell indications of malnutrition and so on, but it's not, you know, it's not precise as we'd like it to be. Um, so there was at least a provision of food, you could access healthcare and sort of ask for some basic treatments and medications. Um, you would perhaps receive some thing for dental hygiene and so on. So, you, you know, there were some elements. What happens at the abolition of enslavement, there's a period where um, enslaved people have to serve as apprentices. So basically it's, you know, free labor, but we're teaching you how to, how to learn a trade that you know already very, very well because you've been doing it. Anyway, um, at that point, when enslaved people are no longer attached to plantations, and it must have been an incredibly, it must have been one of just psychologically one of the most difficult moments, because, of course, you want to be free and you don't want to work on plantations anymore, but there's also no jobs for you outside of the plantation. What can you do? So a lot of enslaved, formerly enslaved people at that point of emancipation, they actually um, uh, migrate to the coast and they take up fishing. And the way that I can explain this in more detail is that they, there, is, there is no knowledge of fishing in Mauritius at this point. Many communities are coming from inland regions that have been um, migrated to the coast. They don't necessarily have boat building technology as part of fishing practice, part of their um, oral tradition. So the boats are adopted, the Bretan, the, the French style boats. So it really tells you that there was, there was no knowledge of, of this kind of um, um, practice to fish. So again, you're moving into a profession, but one where you're, you're not inherently knowledgeable, you're having to learn all of that knowledge. So it must have been an incredibly debilitating moment because you don't have money. All that you eat has to come from your own resources. Um, and so, and you, if something happens to you where you're ill, unwell in any way, that who do you turn to? You don't, you can't afford to pay for healthcare. And the free healthcare that was provided before is, is no longer available to you. So you really are in, in one of the worst moments, um, right at that point where you think you're free, actually the realities of being in a colonial, still a highly colonial place and on a plantation economy make themselves very evident. 
I have some salvia related questions. Is there evidence oh. that the population didn't chew salvia in addition to smoking it? Yeah, we, it would be very difficult for us to, uh, we are looking at the dental calculus and other um, types of residues. Um, at the time, those human remains, the wish of the Le Monde Heritage Trust Fund and local community were to be reinterred, uh, undergo a process of reburial and proper um, memorialization. So we can't analyze those human remains again. Um, at the time, we, because the analysis of the pipes came after our osteological analysis, that was primary concern. So we wouldn't be able to tell now whether there was any residues for salvia chewing or something like that. The other thing as well, I'm almost certain that salvia couldn't have been chewed because there's no indications that it was ever propagated locally. It, it's a very particular ecological niche where it does actually grow. Um, and it hasn't been propagated since, you know, 1960s. So how it would have even been transported as a live product to be established uh, um, as a viable crop, of, if, you, if you will, um, it, it doesn't seem as if it would work. The biology of the plant is against that. So it does seem as if it was a smoke product. Okay, and then that, that goes to the next question I was going to ask you, that was exactly the question, did it grow there or were dried leaves imported? And I think that's what you were sort of, you were getting at. Yeah, it seems that dry, dry leaves would have been imported. Um, even that is a bit of an odd context because um, if the plant was naturally chewed, why would you dry it? So it looks as if, I mean, there's, there's other networks, there's other um, uses of these plants making themselves present. And it looked, you know, sailors were incredibly important at this time, of course. Um, th this sort of presentation also speaks to something else. The, 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 you, the agency of enslaved people to promoting, to helping science develop because in many cases, it, during these voyages, enslaved people were asked to go and collect plants that then were named as scientific um, rarities or unique scientific um, discoveries. But actually they were collected by enslaved people. There was a lot of use of enslaved knowledge in the plantation economy because Europeans were coming to parts of the world that they have very little understanding of the ecology and dynamics of soils and so on. So they, it's just all of this is completely masked. And of course, and fortunately, we're doing this work in Mauritius, colleagues of ours at Limon Heritage Trust Fund, they're looking at the oral traditions. There was a lot of knowledge brought to Mauritius from Africa and from Southeast Asia with the laboring peoples on the types of plants that could be used locally because there were similarities, particularly for people who are coming as enslaved people from Madagascar. Um, so you can see it was a population that wouldn't necessarily have been created elsewhere. Mozambique and Madagascar is quite distant when you're talking about East coast of Africa and a, and a large island enclave. In Mauritius, they become a population and they are, you know, descendant communities are both Madagascan and Mozambican in heritage. And that knowledge looks as if it was being passed on. So, you know, how, how it ends up in the, in the pipe of an enslaved man is going to be, we'll probably never have the answer to that, but just drawing the network around it is already something fascinating. So keeping along those lines of saying, talking about spiritual practices or, you know, medical practices being traced back to Mozambique and Madagascar, what other, uh, other than salvia, what, are there other traditional medical plants that you're finding or other things that you're connecting to uh, medically to Mozambique and Madagascar and sort of the traditions of the folks where they're coming from? Yeah, yeah, at the moment, I mean, with, so this, these analyses have sort of triggered us now to start looking at these contexts more broadly to sort of a, we've got bottles um so these burials i, I didn't show you too many pictures just because of time but these burials are in christian burial so this this site isn't even recorded on any maps until well into the just you know 1890 is the first record and it's it's recorded with a cross even though it's not actually consecrated ground it's not a, a, a christian burial ground and of course, although enslaved people in principle should have been baptized and, and um, followed Christianity, um, the, of course, traditional practices were maintained. So there's a lot of evidence, not necessarily from medicinal plants, but as I mentioned to you, um, Ben, there's a whole culture, syncretic culture um, called Longanis, which is an entirely spiritual, meant for both healing, but also in some cases, sort of retrib retribution against somebody who's done you harm. There's a lot of um, the, the 
cemeteries themselves, because of interments, have huge power and symbolism. So around these, around most cemeteries in Mauritius, there are these um, um, sacrifices. Now, in the past, they involved actual animal sacrifice. Now it seems to be more, you know, cutting a, a lemon or using red, um, sorry, candles to signify the letting of blood and the sacrifice, the the cutting of a of a thing as a form of sacrifice. So although we don't, I mean, um, as I mentioned to you, we do have colleagues who are working on the oral traditions and what plants are known. Um, that's not really been present in our own work till up, up till this moment. And to be honest with you, actually, medicinal use of plants is, is a huge, it's still a, a very prominent thing in Mauritius locally. Um, and we're only just starting to look at that now. Um, how are you getting to the oral tradition? How is that? How, how, how are you figuring that out? What's, yep. it, does it, is it continuing in? traditional stories and or how are you getting to that oral tradition? Uh, so we sort of our work has very much been sort of uh, sorry this is something to explain if my training is entirely as an archaeologist it's only coming to the US because of the four field um, framing of anthropology that I'm an, arch an anthropologist here but my training is archaeology so I'm sort of learning over these last period being in, in the US over a decade now in anthropology department finally learning some of these really significant techniques of ethnography but we already have good ethnographies in Mauritius by other um, social anthropologists and anthropologists more generally. We're undertaking some of that for ourselves now and trying to marry and match our archaeological work um, from, you know, two, three hundred years ago yeah. um, with what's happening in the what, what can be recorded from the last 70, 80 years. Okay. Um, so we've really so for this for the papers um, from this uh, series, there's a three papers that are coming out from the research that I've presented today. Um, we spoke to people who knew about the uses of marijuana by indentured laborers because it was actually permitted. Um, 90 something percent of laborers who are coming were male. And so the not only was the work debilitating, but the psychological stress of not having um, female counterparts, not women who are incredibly important in religious perspectives, of course, in work, of course, in the home, of course, in all facets of life, you know, one, 50% of a population is absent. It's, it was just immensely debilitating. So um, local government allowed extensively, in fact, provided alcohol, but also allowed the use of marijuana, which only, particularly alcohol, only served to really um, reinforce social problems and make it much, much harder um, uh, and in fact, indentured laborers had some of the highest rates of suicide at that time, probably in the world, uh, because the situation was so debilitating. Um, a question, what was the gestational age of the fetus in the coffin birth? It, it literally just at the eight, eight, eight and a half, nine month period. It's not so easy for us. We, we're not that, we're not capable of being that accurate. Um, but it was a fully formed fetus ready, uh, really ready at the moment of birth, as we could tell. Um, actually, let me see. I'm getting a, a, another salvia question. What is the advantage of using salvia? Does it contain nicotine? Is it addictive? Does it contain pain reducing agents? It, salvia has very, it is much more um, what we would maybe move in the, in, along the stream of um, it's, it's very difficult to find the right term because drugs is such a loaded term. Medicinal plants means one thing, recreational use means another. But if you sort of just accept my generalizations here that we're talking about this category of plants that have more than, than non-food uses directly, um, whether we call them spiritual or recreational or medicinal, um, these herbs, have a range and you know it can have relatively little medicinal use but highly psychedelic for example or on the other end can be psychedelic etc cetera, etc cetera, but also can be highly medicinal without the psychedelic effect marijuana happens to depending on which type you're cultivating it can be one of many things so salvia it's only that form that has the active agent and i'm sorry i'm it's i'm not I have this all written in the paper. It's not absolutely, all the facts are not clear in my head. It's the only, um, 
uh, it's noradrenaline that it affects specifically, it targets a specific receptor in the brain. It's the only species of the Laminaceae, the salvia group, because there's many others, and they all have variations in the extent to which the active agent um, works. So it's a really particular plant. It affects the brain in a particular way. Usually that was recreational. But with more research now, they're starting to see, particularly for oral hygiene, but also, funny enough, many of these plants are to help you with diarrhea because diarrhea was something, if you had diarrhea in the past, that could literally be life-threatening because if you don't stop that, you're just depleting your body at such a, a rapid stage. Um, it can lead to much further complications. So it looks if there is some uses of marijuana, uh, sorry, of salvia for relief of diet, um, dealing with diarrhea. But overwhelmingly, salvia seems to have been used um, within a spiritual context, not necessarily medicinal. So maybe that was part of it, um, kind of emulating what in North American indigenous context, tobacco has much more social meaning than when it came to Europe. Um, in the same way, marijuana has much more social meaning um, in parts of the world where it has a long tradition of use. So maybe salvia was actually framed into um, not something seen as medicinal, but something seen as um, both recreational and medicinal. And in fact, just I just step back and say this whole class of plants, drugs as a topic in general, were actually controlled by the rules of food. It's only with this change in labor, it's only with the colonial period and post-colonial um, 19th and early 20th century, in, in fact, 1928, 29, when we decide to say opium is, is heroin is a, a very damaging thing. And we schedule marijuana with opium at that time, um, that this whole kind of conceptual change in how we view drugs. If you view drugs as, plant, as food, you kind of see that it fits into your life in a certain way. When you see, when you view drugs as something um, outside of popular culture, that's something marginalized. When you see drugs as something that has a very specific uses um, to get you outside of your head, to deal with work, to deal with the psychological stress of work. We're not, we're not, generally we're not working. Many people use marijuana today to deal with the stress of work, but yet they sit behind a desk all day. Is, are those things comparable? Well, actually, maybe they are. How work affects us has changed in recent years. And that's really, this research fits within that whole broad context. Work has changed, so has our relationship with those things that help us deal with work. Uh, there's some questions about the date. So how long was the site occupied? The particular data that you were presenting, what period does that date to? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't make that absolutely clear in the presentation. I would just use those broad categories. Um, the period of enslavement uh, is, you know, we're ending around 1934, um, but the abolition of trade and slavery has already taken place in 19, 18, sorry, 18, I said 1834, sorry, not 1934, excuse me if I said 19. Um, in 1807, the abolition of the trade and slave uh, takes place and the British in particular British Navy are doing making efforts to to stop the trade but it was still legal to own people in fact it was still e legal to own slaves in 1888 in in um, Brazil 1970 in Oman so it's you know it's it's again it's not something completely uh, this is a date and that's when things ended that wasn't the case at all what we found in this site, we actually had some coins. There's a, a whole story behind these coins, but we probably don't have time to go into it. But these coins are from 1815 from Italy, from the very short period, basically, that Napoleon had hegemony over Italy and was, was minting coins. So we have a small window, and we know these coins ended up in Mauritius. We know the window of production for these coins is relatively small, so we can help us date the site. We've also got carbon dates that came to around the same period, sort of 1850, 1830, which is right at the point of emancipation, um, right at the point at which slavery is being abolished in, in Mauritius. It's a little bit after the trade in slavery has been abolished, but which sort of fits with that general um, uh, time frame. The other thing as well is that that region was never one heavily used for um, for plantation economy heavily because it's quite mountainous it wasn't used very much for sugar that was a bit further away so this really was one of the the less populated even in the present day 
um, less populated areas. So it, it works very well, um, the landscape as well, for a place where enslaved people could run away and, and hide. Um, and we know that there were raids and so on. So there is an oral tradition, also historical records noted um, for raiding and so on from this particular area. Uh, so the dates um, really fit our dates for the site, our dates of the artifacts, our carbon dates, and what we're seeing generally from the historical records all fit very well for a date right at the point at which emancipation takes place. So it looks like those child inhumations are unfortunate for another reason as well. They were probably some of the first freeborn, genuinely free Mauritians. Uh, so not colonial groups coming in, not laboring peoples coming in, actual Mauritians born on that, on that island as free people, um, but the conditions of their life were such that they didn't actually make it past childhood. A question here from Eve who asked a student at SNHU and she says, she wants to know what kinds of crops were grown in that area? How did that affect the bodies of the enslaved peoples and the injuries that they endured? The main crop, uh, so, excuse me, Mauritius is odd compared, Mauritius is much more like the Atlantic um, because it's a plantation economy. Right. But that, that really takes place with the British. Now, the plantation economy is introduced with the French, but it's a much more varied economy. There's indigo, aloe, sugar is introduced. With the British, the British have a massive empire and they uh, levy sugar duties across all of their colonies. So there's, there's no more, um, in the past, because Mauritius was a French colony, you were paying a levy to sell your sugar to any, um, to Britain, for example. Well, when that's leveled, British sugar costs the same to produce effectively everywhere in the world. You're not paying a levy. So Mauritius starts to produce a hell of a lot of sugar, uh, between 7 to 10% of the world's sugar um, by about 1855. So you can see the impetus. So of course, sugar became king. Um, and that the type of labor, I haven't been able to show you images. I've, I've shown you some of the nicer pictures of Mauritius, but actually Mauritius is a volcanic island. There's boulders of, of basalt everywhere. So to work, is really about clearing the land. And there's excellent work by one of our colleagues, Julia Haynes. Her work is on a plantation site itself um, called Bradeux, 5,000 acre plantation. And all of these, everything from small cobbles like this up to huge boulders had to be moved by hand. So that was the effort of these people, as well as, I mean, to describe sugar plantation as backbreaking is an understatement because you know, you're bent double because of the climate as well. It's right in the Tropic of Capricorn, very, very strong sunlight, um, not just heat, not just humidity, but also a strong glare of the sun. So um, sugar, uh, the, the workers on sugar plantations, they, they're starting work three, four in the morning, um, really backbreaking work. Every single stem of sugarcane has to be cut by hand and moved by hand and then it can be loaded onto a cart and then it's, it's transported. The milling process as well was largely done with a, with a lot of uh, human effort. Of course, there were subsequently machines, but there was a lot of human effort throughout that. And then maintaining the land in a, in a, in a way that it could be um, fertile. And the, um, every time there's movement of, of any sort of terrestrial movement, there's more rocks that need to be brought up. Every time there's plowing, there's more rocks that brought up that need to be cleared. It's a constant process. Um, in your research, uh, a question uh, from Peter that says, are you finding evidence for violent death as indication of maybe crime in the community based on the social conditions? We, we haven't found that yet, but this is a relatively small cohort. We've excavated a number of other sites, but in general, we don't find evidence of interpersonal violence. Um, it, I'm sure it existed, especially when you're sort of mixing a very hardworking environment with, you know, cultural hegemony with alcohol. Um, you know, it, it probably wasn't, a, it was no doubt a very tough situation to live in, um, but we don't find indications of interpersonal violence. We Most of the pathology that we find are directly related either to malnutrition, infectious disease, or very much the hard working conditions of life. Um, I'm going to, uh, along those lines, so sort of talking about the, the personalities of the folks 
uh, of the enslaved and the indentured, uh, a question about um, is there evidence of a social hierarchy within either the enslaved people and within the indentured communities? Oh, uh, in terms of, um, I could speculate somewhat from our sites already, particularly from, and I, I just be honest with you, uh, Ben and the whole audience, we have very, very little information about enslaved people mm -hmm. from, from anywhere in the world effectively, because unless we find um, burial grounds, some settlement, it's very, very ephemeral material culture. So what we do find, of course, we, we really make an effort to extrapolate as much as possible from. There is, uh, it's difficult to say hierarchy, but certainly memory, because these inhumations, there's many, you can see that the person is buried here, one level of stones might be here, another is there, they're slightly off, there could be three or four levels of stone Increasingly, the stones grew in size. Increasingly, there were more use of, there was greater use of basalt cut, basalt block. So there was definitely memory. And some of these individuals have more care um, in terms of this memorialization process. Some of these individuals have more artifacts in their graves and some are very specific, i.e. pipes or, or bottles and so on. So whether that's indicative of um, respect or hierarchy is, is not clear. For the indentured laborers, yes, uh, we know that there was a class of people called, of in, laborers called Sidars, who were in between the laborers who had, I mean, um, there was no mandate to baptize or teach Creole. Our local language is Creole, a broken French, uh, Patois French. So there's no mandate really. So you had to have somebody, an intermediary for the language. In, in the first instance, um, between the elite, the colonial elite and the workers. So there was already very, very prominently recorded historically um, social hierarchy there, but also then there was hierarchies because of, although in principle, the caste system should have, was, was not transported um, legally, shall we say, the British didn't adhere to, they didn't perpetuate it. But of course, people recorded their caste when they arrived in Mauritius. And Mauritius is, is interesting because with the advent of indenture, it's actually the first time that, it, we, again, we could stand to be corrected, but it seems to be the first time that photographs of somebody are used to mark who they are. And they, you know, a little pass is provided. There's a mark on a ledger. So the whole process of indenture was very formal, very British, um, you know, bureaucratic. It's the first time to all of us now carry an ID, a photo ID as a matter of course. Possibly one of the first iterations of that used en masse was in Mauritius to record indentured laborers because before the registry for enslaved people was completely um, uh, ad hoc, shall we say, in some in some cases. Not sorry, that's that's not. I don't. Historians will be mad at me if I say that. Of course, enslaved people were recorded, but it wasn't to the same extent of for, uh, to kind of the extent of formality um, that we see implemented during the period of indenture. And there was also a lot of informal um, during the period of illegal enslaved. Um, trade, trading, there was a lot of informal um, in, say, uh, populations um, brought informally to the island without any register, not at the ports and so on, because there's a lot of small little harbors that could be used. So uh, the context was fundamentally different. Last question for you. Can you tell us more about the sculpture you showed at the beginning? Where is it? How large is it? Who made it? Yep. So I'm sorry, I can't answer all those questions. It's to my absolute shame. And I, I shouldn't have used that picture. I should have anticipated that question. Sorry, but it's it's right at the, um, so uh, the Le Mans heritage, uh, um, uh, heritage site itself is right on the coast. There's an enclave that's been designated with all, with a lot of sculptures from around the world, in fact, um, uh, sort of representing what enslavement, you know, artistically representing what enslavement might have been like. The material, as I mentioned to you, was basalt, um, but I cannot tell you the artist, and that's to my shame. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. We'll do a follow-up. You can send it to us. We'll mail it out to everybody who was here, and they'll get thank that you. information. Chris, thank you so much for joining us this Pleasure. afternoon. Thank you so much. I know you have to run off and catch a flight to Madagascar, so <laughs> you are, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, the other talks as well. And uh, like I said, for the folks who are listening, uh, if you can see my screen now, we will have, we do have Chris's talks 
uh, Chris's talk that he gave earlier and this one, they will both be up on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com archaeology slash archaeology TV. Uh, and we hope that uh, you enjoyed this talk and that you will join us for our next uh, Archaeology Hour and Archaeology of Bridge Talks with Dr. Alaka Wali from the Field Museum in Chicago. You can find all the information for all the talks on our website. Just go to archaeological.org slash lectures uh, and you will get all the information and you will be able to register for all these talks. Uh, as I said at the beginning, support our programs, make a gift to the AIA at archaeological.org slash donate. Uh, and you can become a member at archaeological.org slash join. Krish, thank you again for joining us and for being our inaugural Archaeology Hour speaker and the first in our Archaeology of Bridge season. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all again. Thank you to your audience as well. Thank you, Ben. Take care. All right. Bye. Safe travels. Thank you, sir.